Yes, uh, today is uh, October the 17th, 2012. Uh, my name is Charles Pace, and um, I was invited to a conference call by uh, Brother Graham, and um, <clears throat> I did go to the conference call. It was about... Um, um, whether Waco should be the headquarters uh, of the movement in the uh, finishing up of the work. And um, I would like to share what I couldn't share on the phone call, even though everyone said that it was an open. Um, I'll read this. This is the um, email that I got. And I'm sure you all got it too, those that uh, I'm sending this to, because I have the addresses of the um, individuals who it was sent to. And I would like you all to listen to what I have to say, um, painstakingly uh, see if there's any truth in it. And if not, just check it out. If there is truth in it, and I want you to get in contact with me. Um, because I have um, some pertinent information for you and I have a proposition to make with you, um, a good one, if you're listening to what the Spirit is saying. So, location revisited was going back to Waco a big mistake. Now I could have we could have worded that in a, in a more positive way, um, but so be it. Greetings, dear brethren. Please see the attached document for the upcoming Friday night call. We made some discoveries that you need to know about. If you cannot open the document, please read the message below. Location revisited was going back to the original headquarters a big mistake. New findings from two Mountaindale Dale, uh, studies may prove to be the strongest reasons why we must abandon the original spot and finish the work for Mother elsewhere. There will be a unity conference. That's cute. A unity conference. Call this coming Friday night. We are inviting all leaders, that's all leaders in capital letters, all laity, and all associations for a round table discussion as we review together possibly the best presentation against working from the original location. Now, this is very important, and if you didn't mean it, then don't write it. We are inviting all leaders, all laity, all associations. I happen to be a leader of an association uh, that believes in Brother Hodder's writings, Ellen White's writings, Jones and Wagner's writings, but we also believe in more, okay? Just like you believe in more than the Seventh-day Adventists, and you know how Seventh-day Adventists look at you, okay? They think that you're of the devil. So I know that you already think of us as the devil, which is okay, because you're accused, you see, you're accused of being the same, because you have more light. You desire to follow a uh, re God's representative, okay, as you see fit. So what I'm trying to say here is this. If you're asking all associations and all leaders and all laity to come to this unity conference call because you want to come into unity, don't shun or ostracize one that comes with new light or different light or a different... Um, uh, perspective than yours. 
That's what this is all about. The first thing that happened when I opened my mouth on the conference call was I was cut off. So it's obvious that you're not uh, meaning what you say, which is basically, you're basically telling me that you're going to tell me how the Holy Spirit's going to bring us into unity because it has to do with what you are doing and not with what the Holy Spirit's doing, you see. And from what I understand, the um, moves of God are going to be contrary to human devising. Contrary to what you think. As Laodiceans. So, because you wouldn't allow me the time to express what the Spirit has put on my heart, I'm going to do it in this format and I'm going to send this to each and every one of you and I want to see if you really are desiring to be in unity and if you really do want to let the spirit uh, you know lead okay uh, because it's quite obvious by your actions whether you are letting the spirit lead or not so let me read uh, this next part here some of you may be surprised at our findings. Come and let us reason together. Please leave your skepticism, prejudice, and preconceived ideas at the door. Now, whoever this is that wants to uh, promote this idea, uh, you know that you can't get anywhere with anyone, especially your so-called you know, Davidian brethren that want to be in unity. You cannot uh, even begin if they're going to be prejudiced and they're going to be skeptical and they're going to can't hold on to their preconceived ideas uh, because you cannot even begin to teach new light if if these conditions exist the door is going to be slammed in your face okay so you need to be open-minded and open-hearted uh, to all if you're inviting all leaders and all associations and all laity, then you have to be open-minded enough to hear them out. Or what you're doing here and what you're saying here is, uh, you, you know, you're just wasting everyone's time. You're wasting the Holy Spirit's time. The Holy Spirit cannot work under these circumstances. So you're back to square one. You're not going to get anywhere with anybody. If you're not going to, if spiritual things are spiritually discerned, if you're not going to let the Holy Spirit uh, move on the hearts and minds of the people and let the Holy Spirit express what needs to be expressed or forget it. This is not a move of God. This is not the Holy Spirit working. This is you trying to get your idea across and to be uh, accepted. Especially when you shut the door on someone that is coming to you with, with uh, um, to share something with you that the spirits put on their hearts. And you shut the door in their face or you slam the, uh, the receiver down because you don't want to hear them. Because it doesn't agree with what you're saying. That's what... You know, putting away skepticism, prejudice, and preconceived ideas means, right? So let's do that and listen to what the Spirit has to say. Not what you have to say, what the Spirit has to say. We want to simply go through the document as prima facie evidence that would, if uncontested, if uncontested, forever dismiss the notion of working from original Mount Carmel Center. And remember, as Davidians, we are obligated, obligated to hear the reason the messenger may give. So join us. So I joined. So I joined. But I got rejected as soon as I opened my mouth. I wasn't even allowed one minute 
uh, to express myself, and I got cut off halfway through what I was trying to explain. That's not fair. That's not, you know, you're not oblig- you're not making yourself obligated to listen to what I say when you shut me off like that or shut anyone off that way. That's not the way of the Holy Spirit. That's man's way. The spirit of unity and merger is in the air. Let's hope so. Let's hope so. 2012 has become the year of convocation and talks of unity. This should be the highest interest to all present truth believers. That's true. It should be the highest interest. And in light of certain grassroots movements underway, this may be one of our most important conference calls to date now these grassroots movements the only way they can be of the Holy Spirit is if you're presenting and you're uh, uh, doing things accordingly as the Spirit would do them and this is what the Spirit would do what is the sign of unity I just read this morning uh, in the prayer thought that we had in our if we love our brother and we're willing to painstakingly hear what this person has to say because we can win them or they can win us over. It takes love. Agape love. Not Philene love. Not brotherly love. But agape love. A love that's based on divine principle. That's why Christ loved us. So, those who have not been living in in Christian fellowship will draw close to one another. Now, Davidians haven't been living in Christian fellowship. They haven't been close. They've been um, um, basically debating uh, over doctrine and so on and so forth. That has to go out the door. You can't, you can't debate doctrine. The truth will stand on its own. What we have to do is be seeking the truth and seeking a relationship with the Holy Spirit and with one another through the Holy Spirit. And if you're not doing that, well, then we're never going to have unity. The body of Christ is always going to be divided. So it says those who have not been living in Christian fellowship will draw close to one another. Now, there is division among Davidians. There's a division amongst branch Davidians. And there's division amongst branch Davidians and Davidians. It seems like no one's getting along. And we're supposed to be working for the salvation of the mother church, which is SDA. Well, if we don't have the if we don't have any unity among ourselves, why in the world would we want to bring uh, Seventh Day Adventists into that disunity? All it's going to do is mock God. So we need to shape up and straighten out. One member working in right lines will lead other members to unite with him in making intercession for the revelation of the Holy Spirit. It says that one member is going to do this, not many. One individual is going to do this. The Lord has one individual that he has anointed and appointed to do this. He's taken the reins into his own hands through this individual. And he's not using any of the other uh, so-called vice presidents or uh, any presidents because he's the only one that can appoint and anoint a president. And by electing vice presidents, that doesn't make what you're doing any better. You're still sidestepping what God's going to do and what God wants to do. So, one member, and that would be that individual that the Lord has anointed and appointed, working in right lines, the right lines because they're what God or the Lord wants him to do, will lead other members to unite with him in making intercession 
for the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Now, this either means that there's going to be a revelation of who the Holy Spirit is, the work and the office and the gender and the um, uh, intercession and uh, the anointing and uh, so on of the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit is going to make known what we should know about this certain um, idea of where the work should be um, headquartered, whether it should be in Old Mount Carmel or in Waco at all. But the Holy Spirit's going to tell us. There will be no confusion because all will be in harmony with the mind of the Spirit. You see, if we're going to listen to the Holy Spirit and we're all going to be in the mind of the Spirit because we're already conceded to whatever the Holy Spirit tells us, we're going to do that. Okay? Then there won't be any confusion because all I see is confusion right now. You don't know whether it should be in Waco or it shouldn't be in Waco. You don't know whether it should be in at Old Mount Carmel or... There is a new Mount Carmel, you know, in Waco. And it had to do with Brother Hodiff and Sister Hodiff. There will be no confusion because all will be in harmony with the mind of the Spirit. The barriers separating believer from believer. That's the barriers that we've put up between us. If you cannot sit and listen to what I have to say without any prejudice like I exist, like I have a right, just as much as you have a right. I am a second th tither. I have a right. If you can't sit and listen to me like you want me to listen to you, well, then we don't need to uh, be doing this. We have to break down the barrier. And the barrier is prejudice. It's skepticism. It's what we've heard all the time we've been Davidians or all the time we've been Seventh-day Adventists. Don't listen to those Davidians. They're of the devil. Or when we've been Davidians, Seventh-day Adventists. Oh, don't listen to those branches. They're of the devil. If you're really being honest with the Holy Spirit and you really want to know what the Holy Spirit is saying, then you will listen, regardless of who it is. Because we've all got a piece of the puzzle. And the Holy Spirit wants us to come together in unity as brethren. The Holy Spirit has taught us all truth. Because truth comes from the Spirit. The Spirit of prophecy. Not the individual uh, spiritual leaders. It was given to them by the Spirit of prophecy. And it's going to be put together. And... Uh, understood by that same spirit because that spirit never died the prophets died the spiritual leaders died yes they're going to be raised and take up their work in the kingdom but the Holy Spirit is going to set up the kingdom before they're raised from the dead because they take up their work in the kingdom and in order for that uh, setting up of the kingdom to take place there has to be a living individual that the Lord has anointed and appointed to do that work. Now you either believe what the spirit of prophecy says. 1 TG number 8 says it all. Look it up. The Lord takes the reins into his own hands. Out of the Laodicean or the Seventh-day Adventist church or movement emerges another church of which Joshua is in charge. He's the highest official in the church. He's the first one to have a garment change. If he doesn't have the garment change, no one else has it either. Okay? Now, this is how the Lord shows that he's taken the reins into his own hands. By anointing and appointing a leader, a present-day Joshua. A living, anointed individual that can interpret he's the Zechariah interpreter he can understand all things he can choose the good and refuse the evil he's able to do that through the anointing because it's the anointing that breaks the yoke 
Now, we either believe that God has a person, or we either believe in what Brother, Brother Hart have said, or wrote, okay, or we just throw it all out, because you can't just rip the pages out that you don't want to, you know, hear. You have to hear them all. You have to listen to them all. You have to read them all. Or we're never going to come into unity with the Spirit. Because it's the Spirit that we have to come into unity with. And if we come into the unity with the Spirit of prophecy, the Holy Spirit, the author, then we will all come into unity. Because that Spirit is leading all of us into all truth. Convicting us of sin and testifying of him, the word. Testifying of the word. So we have a choice. We either do it God's way and find our way to the kingdom or we do it our way and we find our way to the slaughter of Ezekiel 9. Because that's exactly what's going to happen to everyone that refuses the um, present truth message that the Spirit is giving shows the abominations that have been adhered to by the leadership. Now, if you're not sighing and crying against the abominations, then you're going to be slaughtered with those that are perpetrating the abominations. The barriers separating believer from believer will be broken down. And God's servants will speak the same things. Now, if we're not speaking the same things, that means that those barriers have not been broken down. Now, that's either because of our skepticism, prejudice, you see, of preconceived ideas. Because we're not letting the Spirit bring us into harmony. And the Spirit will break down those barriers if you'll give the Spirit a chance. But you have to have the spirit of love in your heart. Brotherly love, agape love, you see. Or it's not going to work. We're a family. And we have to love one another as equals. Or we're not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. That's taken from Tract 8, page 107. So, this gave the conference time. And it was Brother Graham. Brother Graham, thank you for uh, inviting me. I've spoken to you, I believe, many times. You've come to Mount Carmel, if it's the Brother Graham that I know. And uh, I appreciate, I've always uh, felt that you were uh, wanting to know all the truth. You're, you're going to seek the truth until you found it. So I'd like to share with you my you see, my experience with Mount Carmel and where it should be and, you know, the Mount Carmel in Waco. I happen to live on Mount Carmel. Not old Mount Carmel. There's no way that it, I would be allowed to live there because I'm a Branch Davidian, see? But on, Bran uh, on, on New Mount Carmel, it's owned by Branch Davidians. I'm the, the trustee of New Mount Carmel. I own the 77.86 acres that are in my name as a trustee. That makes me the leader of this Branch Davidian, you see. Not the Branch Davidian church that David Koresh had. That's defunct. That went into perdition. That church was judged by the Lord. And he slaughtered the leadership, old and young men, maids, and little children. And he burned them up. Burned the whole place down. So Mount Carmel is to be built on its own heap now. Rebuilt on its own heap. He purified this place. He overturned it three times. And then it was no more. But now he's given it to him whose right it is. Why? Because he wants to set the kingdom up here. And he is setting up the kingdom here. Right here in Waco, where Brother Hodov and Sister Hodov, they bought this property because they knew that the kingdom was going to be here. And I'm going to prove that to you. If you'll give me a chance. You want to know where God wants to do to finish up the work? 
whether it's in Waco or not in Waco, whether it's in the old place or whether it's in a new place. It, 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 it's, it, it, it's all here, right under your noses. But you have to listen to what the Spirit's going to tell you and let the Spirit convict you. But you have to put away your preconceived idea. But I'm going to read to you what I have found in the Symbolic Code, uh, Volume 10, Number 1. The very first reference of the Symbolic Codes that you've used to try to prove that Waco, old Mount Carmel, is not the place it should be. And I agree with you. Old Mount Carmel, God was finished with that place. And I'll show you why. This title here, Preparing for an All-Out Effort. This tells me that uh, Brother Hadif recognized the nearness of the time he says here, the hunting campaign launched last year initiated and heralded a new electrifying and progressive advancement of present truth. Now remember, this has been written in 1954, September of 1954. This is before Brother Hodov died. Now again, with even greater emphasis toward reaching her goal, Mount Carmel Center, makes the following announcement to all faithful Davidians who will realize that this good news is perhaps nothing short of a sign. Mount Carmel Center, by commencing to first sell its excess property, then the whole is symbolically leading the way to the program that is outlined by Bible and Spirit of Prophecy in the words. Now, this is, these are the words that he's going to uh, uh, tell you uh, that is a sign. Them selling first the excess and then the whole is symbolically leading the way to the program that is outlined by the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy. Okay? And here it is. Again, the kingdom of heaven. Now he's talking about the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field. Now you can look this up Carmel means a fruitful field. Fruitful field. Carmel. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field or in Carmel. The which, when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. The Lord himself is leading the way. That's Brother Hodov's comment. Now the Lord himself is leading the way because to buy this fruitful field that has a treasure in it, the Lord is telling his servant to sell the excess and then the whole so he can buy that field that Carmel with the treasure in it. And it says, he hideth. He's found a treasure, but he hides it. He doesn't tell anybody about it. And we'll get to what, he, what was hidden here. But God, the Lord himself, is leading the ways. That's what Brother Hodaf wrote. Because the brother Hodif was being led by the Lord himself to sell the Lord's property that was bought by second tithe and uh, the f operated by the first tithe as well. It belonged to the Lord. It didn't belong to any individual. But the Lord is leading the way 
by telling Brother Hadif to sell the excess and then the whole. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is like unto, you see, a treasure hid in a field. A treasure hid in a carmel. Jesus has made it possible for you to accept his love and in happy cooperation with him to work under its fragrant influence. He requires you to use your possessions in unselfish service that his plan for the salvation of souls shall be carried forward with power. He expects you to give your undivided energies to his work. So he's basically telling everyone, your possessions, if given to God's work, are going to make the work or forward to save souls. And you'll be saving your own soul to boot by giving up all that you have to the Lord. Now, Brother Hadif is saying, this is what the Lord shown me. I have to sell the excess and then the whole. I have to sell everything to get this kingdom, to get this field that has a treasure in it. I have to buy that field and I have to do it by not telling anyone I did it. In other words, I hid it. It's been hidden from view that he was the one that bought it. Hidden from view. Would you make your property secure? Place it in the hand that bears the nail print of the crucifixion. Retain it in your possession and it will be to your eternal loss. Give it to God, and from that moment it bears his inscription. It is sealed with his immutability. Would you enjoy your substance? Then use it for the blessing of the suffering. Testimonies, Volume 9, pages 50 to 51. The Lord is telling believers to give up everything that they have. Because if you hold on to it, you're going to lose it. But you're also going to probably lose your soul to boot. So give everything that you have. Sell it. Everything you've got so that you can help buy the kingdom. But where is this, where is this field, you see? Where is this Carmel that needs to be bought? You know that the old Carmel is sold. That's what he was being told to sell. Amen? And it was sold. Everybody knows it was sold. Why would he want to buy it back? If he was told to sell it for another field that has the treasure in it. That is the kingdom. The kingdom is like unto a field that has a treasure. You see? And the man finds this treasure... You see, finds this field with the treasure in it, with the kingdom in it, and he has to sell all that he has. The excess first and then the whole. To buy that field. I saw that if any held on to their property and did not inquire of the Lord as to their duty, he would not make duty known and they would be permitted to to keep their property and in the time of trouble it would come up before them like a mountain to crush them and they would try to dispose of it but would not be able. Now he's telling people about this, uh, you know, sell the excess and then the whole. Get rid of it. He's talking to his own people that are at the head of the work. He's telling, he told Brother Hadif to sell the excess and then the whole and then to buy another field. So why would you want to buy the same field that he sold? 
If truth is progressive, if the Lord doesn't go back, he goes forward, why would you want to go back? But the key is this, that it's in Waco, and it is Mount Carmel. You see? That's the key. But you don't understand how to interpret it. So this property that you should have let go of is going to, you know, is going to be like a millstone around your neck now if you don't get rid of it. Because it was already sold. It needs to be sold again to prove to the Lord that you're willing to give all that you have and to do what he wants you to do. What's in your agenda, Lord? What's on your uh, gospel program? Not mine. I heard some mourn like this. The cause was languishing. God's people were starving for the truth. And we made no effort to supply the lack. There's confusion among Davidians, among Seventh-day Adventists, among Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. There's confusion because they're not being fed the truth. They're not being given the truth. They're just trying to live on the old husks of the past. And there's no nutrition in there. The Joshua, the Emmanuel, feeds the butter and the honey. So that you can choose the good and refuse the evil. So that you can be sustained. So that, you know, what you're eating is tasty, it's satisfying, and you want more. That's what butter and honey does to bread. It makes it satisfying. It makes it tasty. It makes it like you're eating something that's like dessert. You want more, too. It's not that dried up old unleavened bread, uh, you know, that is dry and, 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 and hard to swallow and hard to chew. It's got some substance to it. And it helps you to choose the good and refuse the evil. What more would you want? when you're confused. You want to know how to choose the good, how to make the right decision. Isn't that what you want? That's what most people say to me. You know, it's really hard to choose the truth, you know, to, 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 to choose, make the right decision when there's so many winds of doctrine, so many different opinions, so many people saying this and that about the same thing. Just like Mount Carmel. How do we discern this? How do we decipher this? How do we come into unity about this? Well, read it all into context, like you said. You know, read the whole thing. Well, you left out what I just read to you about the kingdom being like a man that finds a treasure in a field and then he sells all that he has and he hides the fact that he's going to buy the field because he doesn't want anyone to, to know. And everybody says to me, well, Brother Hodiff didn't buy that field. Sister Hodiff did it. Well, where do you think she got the money? I believe that while he was still alive, he came up here and he saw this place. And he knew. He knew that he had to sell the excess and then the whole. Because he had to sell all that he had to buy that field that he saw. And he hid. He didn't tell anybody he was going to buy it. You know, there are people that do title searches and they say, well, his name isn't on the deed. It's the association name that was on the deed. A, vice, a, a president doesn't own anything. All he is is a trustee for the association. So if he was the one that named the association, Davidian Seventh, General Association of Davidian Seventh-day Adventists, then he owned the property. Because he was the only president of that association. And when he died, that association became defunct, according to the bylaws. So the name on the deed had to be General Association of Davidians. I know that that was the name on the deed after it was changed. Or before it was changed, excuse me, before it was changed and brought up to date. So Brother Hodiff, through his association, uh, of which he was president, 
and he was the only one that could buy and sell properties. That's what the president can do. No one else can do that. I believe he bought this property and he kept it hidden. He didn't put his name on it because it belonged to God and he knew that. And it needed to be kept a secret so that you people who are coming in after Brother Hodup, you see, and are wanting to know where the headquarters should be. You're going to have to let the Holy Spirit tell you where that is, just like the Holy Spirit told him. It's hidden. It's hidden from man, but to the believer, it's not hidden. It's revealed, if you'll only listen. And that's what I'm trying to get you to do, listen to the Spirit, what the Spirit is saying. God's people were starving for the truth. And we made no effort to supply the lack. Now our property is useless. Useless. Oh, that we had let it go and, it, and laid it up and laid up treasure in heaven. I saw that a sacrifice did not increase, but it decreased and was consumed. I also saw that God had not required all of his people to dispose of their property at the same time. But if they desired to be taught, he would teach them in a time of need when to sell and how much to sell. See, not everybody was to sell and to put the money towards buying Old Mount Carmel, and New Mount Carmel, because there's a whole generation of young people today that are looking for the, the understanding of where headquarters should be. What happened in 1959 and 1955, you see? What the world happened? Why was Old Mount Carmel sold? Why did it go out of the hands of God's um, anointed? Because it was supposed to. Why did these people buy it back? Because you're going to learn a lesson. You're going to find out that that place is not blessed of God. He had it sold. He's not going to go back and rehash. He wants everyone to move forward, to progress with truth. He would teach them in a time of need when to sell and how much to sell. Some have been required to dispose of their property in times past to sustain the Advent cause, while others have been permitted to keep theirs until a time of need. Then, as the cause needs it, their duty is to sell. Sounds to me like the cause is about to need it again to make this, this move of God, you see, the setting up of the kingdom. Spiritual prosperity is closely bound up with Christian liberality. Liberality. Do you freely give? Do you give liberally? So spiritual prosperity is closely bound up with Christian liberality. The followers of Christ should rejoice in the privilege of revealing in their lives the beneficence of their Redeemer. Christ was always, you know, benevolent, always giving liberally to everyone. Because he saw himself as a steward of, of what God owned and God owned everything he was the creator of the universe he gives liberally to everyone and that's the character he wants us to have and he'll give to you if you're a good steward and give liberally that's what he wants to teach us is to how to become like him the more we have the more we give the more we give, the more he'll give us to give. 
That's how it works. That's that. That's a, a law of the kingdom. The followers of Christ should rejoice in the privilege of revealing in their lives the beneficence of their Redeemer. As they give to the Lord, they have the assurance that their treasure is going before them to the heavenly courts. Would men make their property secure? Let them place it in the hands that bear the marks of the crucifixion. Acts of the Apostles, pages 344 and 345. So if you want security and your property be to be secure, give it to the Lord. He owns it anyway. He just wants you to let it go. And I guarantee you, he'll give it back to you a hundredfold because he knows you will let go. And you'll give. But the more you hold on to it, the more it's going to bring you down like a millstone around your neck. We see each passing day more and more that God requires his people to gladly support his cause. Gladly support his cause. First by their tithes and offerings. Malachi 3, 8 to 10. And at last by selling all. You want the kingdom, you want the work of God to go forward and the kingdom to be set up, well, you're going to have to sell everything you've got because you can't take it to the kingdom with you. You can't take it to the kingdom with you. You have to give it to the Lord and let him take you to the kingdom. If they would enter into life eternal. Let me read that whole uh, uh, sentence again. We see each passing day more and more that God requires his people to gladly support his cause, first by their tithes and offerings, and at last by selling all if they would enter into life eternal. So if we're going to be translated without seeing death and enter into life eternal and actually establish the kingdom of heaven on earth, okay, then we have to give everything that we have up because you're not taking anything with you to heaven anyway. Give it up. Let it go. May help it to, <coughs> excuse me, put it towards the support of the kingdom, the work of God. He who takes part in the first of his requirements will at last, with joy, go all the way by selling all when God gives the command. Thus, only may he joyfully buy the field with the great treasure. He's telling Brother Hadif and those that were with him that were understanding at the time, sell everything to buy the field with the treasure in it. Buy another caramel, another field. It's a new field. But that's the one that has the treasure in it. That's the one that has the kingdom in it. And hide the fact that you're doing it. Don't let everybody know you're doing that. Just sell everything you have and buy the field. For God. It now becomes very obvious that the time is short that he who would be ready for the great supper and for his eternal home will have his eyes open to truth and his heart set on his eternal welfare. That's translation without seeing death. God will direct him day by day. Certainly then, this move could be a signpost to both Davidians and to Laodiceans that the 11th hour message is on the very verge of a final and all-out effort to reclaim the church from the hands of the enemy. From the hands of the enemy, the devil. Reclaim the church. That means the church is in the hands of the enemy. 
and we're going to reclaim it. And the only way we can reclaim it is with an all-out effort. Give everything you've got. Sell all that you have to buy the field with the treasure in it, the kingdom. Be it therefore known that part of Mount Carmel property is being subdivided for high-class residences beginning at the old peach orchard near Mount Carmel entrance. If you go there today and you look up where, he's, where he just said, high-class residences, that's exactly what they are. That's where the lawyers, where the judges, and where the wealthy have bought homes where old Mount Carmel was. They bought it because he sold it. But he sold all of it, not just that part, not just the subdivision. He sold it all because he had to buy another field. God was telling him, the Lord was telling him to buy the other field with the treasure in it. The wise do not consider it a gamble to sell all they have in order to make the kingdom their own. Do you understand what he's trying to tell everybody? It's not a gamble, folks. We're selling everything because we're buying the kingdom. Now listen to this. They know that they are getting a bargain, that such an investment will make them rich. Both the man that bought the field containing the great treasure and the man who bought the pearl of great price sold everything they had in order to close the deals. There's two men here. There's two men here. One sees there's a treasure in that field and another sees that in that field is the pearl of great price. The first man sells all that he has. That's Brother Howdeth. And he buys the field. The other man who comes after him sees the pearl of great price. And he buys the field for the pearl. And he sold everything that he had in order to close the deal. But even though it took everything they both had enough to buy what they had set their hearts on. What the Lord told them to do, they had enough to do it. Now let me help you to understand this and hear what the Spirit is saying. Not your preconceived ideas. Brother Hodiv hid the fact that he bought that field because he had to hide the fact because it had a treasure in it. And he knew that the treasure, that it had a treasure. He didn't know what the treasure was. So God sends another man, another leader, Ben Roden. And he sees that that field that is bought by second tithe money, he sees that that Carmel is being sold. So he has to buy it back. And he sells everything that he has in Odessa. Everything he had, all his property that he had in Ozessa, so that he could come and buy the field here in Waco. The same field that Brother Hodiff saw the treasure in. But Sister Hodiff was selling it off. Because she didn't see the treasure. The treasure was hidden from her. He didn't tell her about it either. But Ben Roden knew about it. And Ben Roden knew about it through his writings. Because he was able to discern and to interpret what Brother Hodiv had written. And he bought it. And that's proof to me that that man, Ben Roden, knew what Brother Hodiv was talking about. And Brother Hodiv knew what the Lord wanted. And that's to sell old Mount Carmel to buy new Mount Carmel. Sister Hodiv didn't see the treasure. So she started liquidating all of Mount Carmel, except for 77.8 acres that Ben Roden was able to buy back. And it cost him everything that he had. Everything. To buy back that field. This field. 
because there's a pearl here, a treasure here that no one has seen except those two men. One saw it as a treasure, the other one saw it as the pearl. And they sold everything they had to acquire the same field. The same field. Right here in Waco. And this field is out in the country where there's lots of room, where there's fresh air, where there's lots of place to grow things, where there's a place where lots of people can gather together. I guarantee you we'll get the rest of the property back. The rest of the 947, or 947 acres, yes. We'll get it all back. Because it wasn't supposed to be sold. But we retained the portion that had the pearl. The wise do not consider it a gamble to sell all they have in order to make the kingdom their own. To make the kingdom. They both saw the kingdom here, folks. They both saw the kingdom, the pearl. They know that they are getting a bargain, that such an investment will make them rich. Both the man that bought the field containing the great treasure, Victor Hodov, and remember, that man hides it. He doesn't tell anybody. He keeps it hidden. And then... The man that bought the field containing the great treasure and the man who bought the pearl of great price sold everything they had in order to close the deals. But even though it took everything, they both had enough to buy what they had set their hearts on. Then who knows but the Lord. Did you get that? Who knows but the Lord that this heart-stirring example may soon turn into a sounding alarm and be followed by every faithful Davidian believer throughout the land. That's the United States. Even now, the Lord's example to raise funds by disposing of his possessions is a loud cry to every Davidian to awake to the fact that he is he in privileged he is privileged to join the campaign with faithful tithe and offering at first and at last to swell the funds by giving everything so that the work may be finished and the saints be gathered home. Being gathered home is being gathered in the barn, in the kingdom. <clears throat> Fear of light, a real tragedy. We can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light. Are you afraid of the light? Are you afraid of the truth? Can you handle the truth when it's given to you? This quotation is taken from the Review and Herald, August the 12th, 1954. Contains more truth than fiction. Can you handle the light? Or is it too bright for you? Is it blinding you? Is it making your eyes hurt? Do you have to cover your eyes because you can't handle the light? In view of the obstinate fearfulness of the Seventh-day Adventist ministry, and I would say, uh, well, let me read it in context and then I'll paraphrase it again. In view of the obstinate fearfulness of the Seventh-day Adventist ministry toward the shepherd's rod message, we may well paraphrase the statement to read. We can easily forgive a layman who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is that the ministers are afraid of the light. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to repeat it for you and bring it up to date. In view 
of the obstinate fearfulness of Davidian Seventh-day Adventist ministry toward the Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventist message, we may well paraphrase the statement to read, we can easily forgive the layperson who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is that the Branch Davidian ministry and the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist ministry are afraid of the light. Now, if, you, if the leading brethren would only make a practical application of this statement by cease to beat the air in their fight against the Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventist message, the shepherd's rod, we believe in the shepherd's rod too because the branch is the fulfillment of it, and stop blocking the way to keep the laity from studying the additional light to the church. That's the branch message to you Davidians, and it's the Davidian message to you Seventh-day Adventists. How quickly the atmosphere of fear of being deceived because of your skepticism, and watch out for the rod, the rodent, would disappear and the whole church reform. What are you waiting for, folks? I want to. I want to. I want to be in all the light, not in just part of it. I want to see all the light. That's why you can't see what's going on, because you don't have enough light. We can be grateful to the Lord that He is now using his 11th hour servants to penetrate the obstructive walls of fear, prejudice, and self-complacency. Well, it's not the 11th hour anymore, folks. It's the 12th midnight. It's the midnight cry. Go ye out to meet him. Behold, the bridegroom's come. Go ye out to meet him. We've gone that far since the 11th hour. This message, this branch Davidian message is, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Make yourself ready. We can be grateful to the Lord that he is now using his 12th hour servants to penetrate the obstructive walls of fear, prejudice, and self-complacency. All are being given an opportunity to either stick with to their eternal loss the fear-mongering boogaboo warnings against the Lord's rod, the Joshua of today, or to fearlessly embrace the additional light regardless of reproach or inconvenience. Now, what I just read should tell you that there were two men buying the same field. One bought it, sold all that he had, Brother Hadop, sold all that he had, and bought another field, Mount Carmel, New Mount Carmel. That's why it was called New Mount Carmel. Because Old Mount Carmel was sold. Sold the old. See? sold the old and bought the new. And you need to understand that when he sold the old that it no longer was to be used as headquarters. Because the kingdom is not going to be set up in the middle of town. The kingdom has to be set up outside the city where there is room enough for expansion. That is New Mount Carmel Center. It's been retained by the work of Ben Roden and all that he did here. He sold all that he had and established New Mount Carmel. The church over the years went into apostasy just like it said it would because the branch, the Lord himself, 
through his body of believers had to take on the sin, the corporate sin, through a corporate body of believers and become the brazen serpent and be crucified before the whole world. Raised up before the whole world. Branch Davidian. That brazen serpent, the branch, was raised up on a rod. The Davidian movement as well. Branch Davidian, that name. That's what everybody hears. And everybody hears it and they say, you know, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed. Well, you should be ashamed of what you did to Christ. You crucified him afresh. Not what happened here brought you shame because you're a Davidian or you're a branch. The shame was felt by the Lord. And this is what both Brother Hodiff and Brother Roden, the two men that bought the field, said. Christ the Word would be crucified afresh by his own professed followers. But he would be raised to glorious exaltation and victory to the shame of his enemies. Ben Roden added, Christ the Word in the branch message would be crucified afresh by his own professed followers, but be raised to glorious exaltation and victory to the shame of his enemies. And it says in uh, John 3, 14 and 15. Everyone knows what John 3, 16 is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only beloved Son that whosoever his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. But do you know what the two verses before that says? Just as Moses raised the serpent, the brazen serpent, in the wilderness, so must I be lifted up, so that all men might look upon me and be healed. And Ben Roden said that the brazen serpent was the branch movement, raised up on a pole, branch Davidian, raised up on a pole, and everybody was looking upon this pre this branch movement, branch Davidian movement here at New Mount Carmel Center. The the um, latter day Calvary, where Christ was crucified afresh by his own professed followers, the leadership of the church crucified Christ afresh. Why? Because they denied him. They denied Christ. They denied his Holy Spirit. And they privately interpreted the scriptures themselves. And they made David Koresh God in the flesh. Their appointed president and Messiah. That's what everybody's doing. In the Davidian movement, in the Seventh-day Adventist movement, in the uh, 1888 movement, in the Branch movement, they're all making, you know, they're all wanting to uh, worship at the tomb of the dead prophets. As if they were alive. As if what they wrote was speaking to them and alive. And they say, hear ye the rod. How can you hear the rod if you're reading what's written? You hear the rod or the ruler or the leader when he speaks present truth. That's when you hear the rod. You don't hear the rod when it's spoken, when it's written. You read the rod. But when an anointed individual can speak it as if it was being spoken for the first time, and it has the anointing with it that breaks the yoke, that is hearing the rod and who hath appointed it. And what the Lord wants everyone to know, that he's taken the reins into his own hands. Read 1 TG number 8, the whole thing. And you'll see that the Lord takes the reins into his own hands. He slaughters the leadership in the church that are, not, uh, that are promoting abominations. The ones that are sighing, the lady that are sighing and crying in the church for the abominations that are being done in the church by the leadership. Now, if you people are leadership, if any of you vice presidents out there think you're leading the church, God leads the church with a president.
that he anoints and appoints himself. Don't be confused. A vice president is not a president. They're a president of vice, if you know what I mean. But they're not anointed and appointed of God. They're elected. Only God can anoint and appoint. And that's how he takes the reins into his own hands after he has slaughtered the leadership who have brought him to open shame before the whole world. Yes, the Lord has to be lifted up as a brazen serpent so that all men might look upon him and be healed. And what Ben Roden added to that quote was this. Everyone that has been bitten by that old serpent, the devil, if they'll look on that brazen serpent, the branch, raised up on a pole, the rod message, the branch Davidian message, and see what happened here, how the Lord judged this church by slaughtering men, women, maids, and little children, slaughtered them through the Delta Force, the five men with slaughter weapons in their hands, men of war, like angels or messengers, slaughtered men, women, maids, and little children here at Mount Carmel Center, New Mount Carmel Center. If this took place in town, it never would have happened the way it did. But God orchestrated the way he did. For 50 days, Pentecost, purification, preparation for the falling of the Holy Spirit. For 50 days, there was a siege here. Purification for 50 days. And on the 51st day, they were slaughtered. Yes, the Assyrian came in and slaughtered the one who dashes in pieces like the Nahum prophecy says. But the one who dashes in pieces began the downfall of the Assyrian. English-speaking Protestant nations and denominations. That's the United States of America. Okay? Britain, is the, the United States and our allies. Britain, Australia, Canada, New Zealand. Their economies are going bust. And the Lord is telling everyone, get out of the yoke of, get out from under the yoke of the Assyrian. How do you do that? You put away your idols of silver and gold, your bank accounts, everything that you own. Liquidate it, buy gold and silver, and bring it to the kingdom, Waco, Texas. Sell all that you have and buy the kingdom. That's what he's telling you all. Come to where the cross was. Come to where the Lord was, was uh, crucified afresh and kneel before him, and make him king of kings and lord of lords. Make him lord of your life. Give all that you have to buy the field. Yea, give all that you have, not to just buy the field that you know Brother Hot have bought, but buy the pearl that's in the field, which is the kingdom. The kingdom of righteousness and peace. May the Lord add his blessing to this study. If you want to get in touch with me, you have my email address. And I'm inviting you all, folks. Mount Carmel belongs to Second Tithers. And if there's any branch Davidians or Davidians that can hear what the Spirit's saying to them, the Spirit is calling you to the kingdom. It's Waco, Texas. But not old Mount Carmel, new Mount Carmel. Come and let us reason together. Brother Graham, you've been here. You know who I am. You know that I'm a reasonable person. You know that I'm a loving brother. I love you. I care for you. I always have. I always felt that you were special. Bring your brethren home. Come to Mount Carmel. And make it the place that Brother Hodaf saw the vision and what Brother Roden saw the vision he saw the they both saw the vision of the kingdom and they sold everything they had to buy the kingdom can you do that will you do that it's time Assyria has fallen the one world order is being set up 
They're about to start the Third World War. The kingdom has been set up here already. Now come to the kingdom. Come to the place of refuge that God has established for you, his believers, in the rod. Hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed him? Not it, him. He's a ruler. His name is Joshua. Joshua ben David. And he's the one that has been anointed and appointed by God, the Lord himself, who has come in judgment. Come to the kingdom. Come to his place of refuge. There's a lot of work that we have to do together under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Bless you all. Bless you for listening and hearing. Amen.